Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a whole new breakdown of a very old book that was banned a very long time ago from the Christian church. This episode is kicking off the apocalypse of Abraham. Now, if you're new to this channel, first of all, welcome. Second of all, on Wednesdays, we always recap what we talk about on the Dark Outpost TV on Tuesdays. Now, if you join us on Tuesdays on the Dark Outpost TV, we do a live show with David Zublick from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where you are able to also call in if you would like to call into the show and participate in the discussion over these banned or quote unquote heretical books. But if you're not on that platform, Wednesdays, I like to recap it for you. In my opinion, these books are super important. I haven't covered one book yet that I feel like is actual heresy. In fact, the deeper I get into these missing books, the more I realize that the church itself is the heresy, not these books that they've taken out of the Bible. For those who don't know, there are supposed to be 777 books in our Bible. We only have about 60 of them. At the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century, that was the first time that they axed a lot of the written material that was originally from the Christian faith. And they also edited the 60-ish books left in the canonized Bible. So we actually, on this channel, going through these missing books, we found places of discrepancy where, for example, in the book of Jubilees that we just finished, we found areas where we can see where they edited Genesis. Why did they do that, do you ask? Well, it's because the church is not run by Christians. The church is run by Satanists. That's right, my friends. Welcome to the free fall of the Great Awakening. A lot of people nowadays understand that we've been lied to a lot in the world but are still having a really hard time recognizing that the church has also lied to us. My response to that is the devil is many things but stupid ain't one of them. Of course the church was the first thing Satan infiltrated. I do have a video which I'll link down in the description box below where I covered Constantine the Great who was not so great, where basically archaeologists have debunked the whole story of him seeing the vision of Jesus and being a Christian. He was not a Christian. He was Mithraic, which is a Canaanite faith. And with his Council of Nicaea in the 4th century, where a lot of books were chucked out and the Bible was edited, he was able to start the manipulation of this new found faith called Christianity. And we're the ones that are lucky enough to live in a time where a lot of these banned books are being found. Yes, most of them still live in the Vatican Library, which is 56 miles long. But in the fourth century, when these books were banned under penalty of death, if somebody owned these books, it was under penalty of death. A lot of the early Christians back in those days, back in the fourth century, who like us were fighting censorship hid these books down in caves and also in tombs in Egypt and in the Middle East. And it wasn't until the end of the 19th century, going into the 20th century, that these old books started to be excavated and found. Once again, the Vatican has not released any of these books. The ones we have accessible to us today were ones that just happened to be found. With that being said, we only have about 45 books at our disposal, so there's still a whole lot left in the Vatican Library or left to be unearthed that we still have not read yet. For me, these books have deepened my faith in God, but my faith has always been in God and not in the church. At a very young age, I saw a lot of manipulations happening in the church that I was not a fan of. So my perspective of the church has always been to take it with a grain of salt. Again, my relationship is with God, not with the church. And it's funny, I'll give you guys a little story of, of a memory that I've had of one, one incident that happened in the church. There were many. But this is one that is a prime example, in my opinion, of how churches can manipulate people and make them vulnerable. So this happened when I was a teenager. I was in youth group. 
And this youth group director got into a lot of trouble later on anyway, and DFAX was called in. There was a lot of shenanigans happening. And of course, the church did not take the proper steps they should have legally. It was a parent of a child that was in the youth group that called DFAX over a situation that had happened that was extremely inappropriate. And all the church did, all the Presbyterian church did, was basically just move this youth director to another church instead of actually doing a thorough investigation as to what was happening with children in the youth department. But the story I'm going to tell you guys happened long before that big incident happened. I must have been about 13 or 14 years old, and as most of you guys know, especially if you grew up in like a Protestant church or Evangelical Southern Baptist or Presbyterian or Methodist or whatever church, the, the youth group will take like weekend getaways. You know, they'll go to like a camping ground where there's a camp set up and the girls have one cabin, the boys will have another cabin, they'll meet at the common area for like Bible studies and group activities and singing and all all sorts of stuff. I went with a lot of my friends away for this weekend trip to this youth program. And the trip was fine and it was the evening time, it was after dinner and the youth director was playing his guitar and singing a song. And all of a sudden it came time for like the group exercise that we were gonna do. And the youth director told all these like young kids, these young teenagers, that we needed to think of all the bad thoughts that we had had about other kids in our youth group and then we needed to go and confess those bad thoughts to these other children in our youth group. Well immediately myself and a couple of my little girlfriends decided we weren't going to participate in this. This is mean. My mother told me basically the same thing that in the movie Bambi if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Why would you go and tell somebody a mean thought that you've had about them that's cruel and it's mean and it makes people insecure and it makes them vulnerable. And so at like 13, 14 years old, I can't remember exactly how old I was. I don't think I was driving yet. My two little friends and I decided that we were gonna go back to our cabin and just go to bed. Like we weren't gonna do this exercise. And we turned to leave and the doors were locked. And the people that were assisting at this weekend getaway, who probably weren't that much older than we were, told us that we could not leave, that we had to participate. We told them that we didn't want to participate because this made us very uncomfortable and wasn't good. The youth director came up and spoke with us and my, one of my friends was told him basically like, this is mean, you're being mean. This is not nice to do. And he told us that we had to participate. And so my two friends and I sat down on the seats. We said, okay, well, people can tell us what they feel about us or what they thought about us, but we're not going to tell other people any thoughts we've had about them because we don't want to be mean to people. We don't want to hurt people. That's not necessary. And so that's what we did. We sat there and we had to have all these people come up to us and tell us all these mean things that they had thought about us, but we didn't say anything in return. Looking back at that now at 38 years old, I am proud of my young self and my two friends for being so young and seeing how horrible that was. That was not godly. That was not Christian. It was mean. It was horrible and it was cruel. But that's the type of deluded bullshit that's taught a lot in these organizations to make people think they're doing a good thing by admitting to other people bad thoughts they've had about them and asking for that per person's forgiveness when the issue didn't even need to be brought up anyway. And we see these le levels of manipulation all the time in these quote unquote Christian organizations. Of course, they also exist in other organizations as well but we heavily see it in the evangelical church. And so if you can think back at your time in church and look at all these tiny little times where you were manipulated, this basically is a form of A-B-U-S-E, mental and emotional and spiritual A-B-U-S-E. And if you can look back on those little incidents of, of times you've experienced and then look at the church at a greater whole and everything it's done to hurt people, not help them, it starts to make more sense when we look at the missing text, the heretical text. The organization of the church doesn't want you to have a private personal relationship with God. They want you to be insecure in your relationship with God, so therefore they can dictate that relationship. 
And reading a lot of these heretical, quote unquote, heretical books, I personally do not feel like they are heretical. I feel like they should absolutely be in the Bible, but that's just my opinion. Reading them, I, I personally have been even more secure in my relationship with God, even more certain in what I believe and more certain of what evil actually looks like. And I can tell you here and now, I have seen more evil in my church growing up than I have ever seen in the quote unquote secular world. But we do know that the church is run by the deep state. We do know it's run by Luciferians, Satanists. When you get to the top of the ladder of each organization, the Catholic Church, the top of the Presbyterian Corporation, the top of the Methodist, Baptist Corporation, whatever it is, you're not gonna find Christians there. Your pastor might be a good hearted Christian, but the people he answers to most likely aren't. If you look at your pastor's seminary school, follow the money, follow the money all the way up to the top. When you find that person, do a deep dive on who they are. Guarantee you they are not who you think they are. They're probably a bloodline family. And y'all know what I'm talking about. All right, so now getting into the apocalypse of Abraham. Now y'all know I love to research stuff. I love learning new things. I, it, I thoroughly enjoy it. And every time I go to research a new book, because as you guys know, I don't just read it. I wanna know what happened to it. I wanna know the history of the text, what scholars think about this text, X, Y, and Z. Y'all know that though. But when I get into the history of these texts, sometimes I find the history even more fascinating than the text itself. And sometimes with the history of these manuscripts of these books, there are so many more rabbit holes to go down. And the Apocalypse of Abraham is one of these books. There are so many different avenues to dig through regarding the history of this book. And I probably will on a later date do a deep dive into some of the organizations that this book has been associated with. Not today for the sake of time and for the sake of actually getting to the text, but in the future, absolutely for sure, I'm gonna do a deep dive on some of these organizations. All right, so let's get into the history of this text. I am gonna be looking between my notes on my computer as well as notes in my notebook. So if you hear some papers rustling around, that's what it's coming from because I have notes everywhere on this text. Because as I said earlier, this is a very fascinating history in my opinion. So a lot of historians consider this text to be a Palestinian Jewish text. Now this is important because there's another group of historians that believe that this text was created outside of Palestine. And we're gonna get into that. I tend to believe that this is actually a Palestinian Jewish text, that this was actually around for a really long time which I'll explain to you guys as we get into my research. So the author of this text is unknown. It's told from the perspective of Abraham, but again, we don't really know for sure who wrote this text. It is considered part of the apocalyptic literature. And so this is a specific subsection of literature that would be prophetic writing during what is called the post-Jewish exile or exilic Jewish culture. So this is when the Jewish people first, well, I take that back. We've seen the Jewish people kind of come and go from their whole homeland throughout the course of history, but this is what the first major immigration or forced removal of the Jewish people from the Middle East. This type of culture started to exist outside of the Middle East. I don't blame them if you were dispersed from your homeland. Of course, as the generations were to pass, you do still want to try to keep that culture alive with your family, with new generations. And so we start to see these writings becoming really important culturally in the apocalyptic literature. So as of today, the text is not an authoritative text by modern Christian churches or Jewish temples and institutions. However, historians do believe that this work was very, very prominent during the first century AD. It's funny how a lot of these texts that are quote unquote not authoritative nowadays, we do know were super important 
during the beginnings of the Christian faith. Very interesting, isn't it? But yet the church tells you they're heresy now. So we have two main places where we can find this text now. One is at the Codex Sylvester, which is a, a codex that's in the library of the printing department of the Holy Synod in Moscow, which is important because that's kind of more Eastern Europe, and we're going to get into that. With the the second place where we can find this text is in the Tolkavaya Palija, and I hope I'm saying that right. So the Tolkavaya Palija is a Book that contains six different manuscripts. They're all written in Old Slavic or Old Church Slavic. And this copy, these manuscripts that we have, were probably written between 70 and 150 AD. So here's where things get interesting because some people will say, oh, this was when this story was created, but other people will say, no, the story that we have in, in this manuscript obviously came from another place first because there are some wordings within the apocalypse of Abraham that point back to Hebrew heritage, which we're going to get into. And we believe that the, these manuscripts were first in Hebrew and Aramaic, then were translated into Greek, and then into Old Slavic, which is how we have them today. These were texts that were full of Old Testament writings and stories. Obviously, this includes the Apocalypse of Abraham and the Ladder of Jacob, which we're going to cover later on. And this survived as the basis for the Eastern Orthodox or Catholic faith. So in Eastern Europe, if you are from East Eastern Europe, you might be more familiar with this story. And I do know from other people who have reached out to me from Eastern Europe that a lot of these books that have been banned by the clergy here in the Western side of the world are still acceptable in the Eastern side, which is very, very interesting. So let's talk about the old Slavic language. This is a language that dates back to the Byzantine Empire. You know, some people call it Byzantian, I call it Byzantine, tomato, tomato. This would include places like Turkey. Now, this is important because when Constantine created his own little new world order and basically ended the Republic and turned it into a one world government of the Roman Empire, he moved his capital from Rome to what we call then, now it's Istanbul, but then he called it Constantinople after himself because he was a narcissistic little prick, all right? But before it was Constantinople, this was called Byzantium. That was the name of the city that was right there where Istanbul is today, it was the crossroads between the East and the West. Now, what's also important about Turkey is that long before Constantine was ever even born, if you can remember back when we read the Acts of Philip, and I'll put that down in the description box below. I will also put down a video about Constantine I did down in the description box below as well. But Philip went into Turkey. Philip wasn't the only apostle who went into Turkey. We've seen many apostles going in that direction. And so we do know that because of some of these apostles that went over to this area, Old Testament works were brought with them. All right? So we know that after Jesus was crucified or executed as he was, the uh, apostles basically had were fugitives. They had basically warrants out for their arrest as well. And so they had to skedaddle out of the Middle East. Some went up into France, some went into Egypt, into Afri African area. We know that Mark was in Alexandria. And then Philip went into Turkey. We know that Thomas, when we covered the book of Thomas, went into India. They all dispersed everywhere. So very, very likely that, that if, if this text is truly from old Hebrew culture, the apostles were Hebrew, they were Jewish, and they were all very well educated within the temple. So it is highly likely that the apocalypse of Abraham would have been with them in their journeys along with the Torah. All right. And as you guys know, the New Testament at this time was in the process of being created. We've talked about this. We had the um, 
whole, the book of the Holy Twelve, which was my favorite so far, which was probably a template that they had, as well as the book of Q, which we also spoke about as well, that they had with them as far as what we would see as New Testament literature. Now, now neither the book of the Holy Twelve or the book of Q have made it into the Bible, but those allegedly were the original Gospels. We also know that the apostles, most of them could not read or write. A few of them could, but most of them couldn't. So any Gospels that are attributed to them by their name, aka Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were most likely written by their students. So if you can put yourself, kind of step back and look at the situation as a whole, the bigger picture of the situation, it is very highly likely that the Old Testament literature was absolutely brought with Philip and some of the other apostles into Turkey, into this area, and that's how the story became so ingrained in the Byzantine Empire. Interesting thing about the Byzantine Empire, um, when the Roman Empire in the West fell, the Byzantine Empire, which was basically the Roman Empire in the East, did not fall. It survived the fall of Rome by about a thousand years. It only fell in 1453 to the Ottoman Empire. All right, so now we look at the English translations. So this this work was first translated into English by the Mormons, by the Latter-day Saints, by E.H. Anderson and R.T. Hagg in 1898 for a Latter-day Saint magazine called Improvement Era. Now this magazine for the Church of the Latter-day Saints was in publication from 1897 to 1790, and they titled this book The Book of the Revelation of Abraham. Now, I have read the Book of Mormon before, um, just long before I ever did YouTube. I'm just, as y'all know, I'm just really super curious about what people believe, and I believe that the church just the church of the Mormon church as well as the Christian churches are obviously very, very corrupt, but we can't ever throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, so I think it's kind of cool that they, they were the first to kind of say, Hey, let's take a look at this. What is this literature that the Eastern Orthodox church has in old Slavic? Let's, let's see what it says. Now, my friend Tom, Tom Numbers, that you all know, Sight Club on YouTube, grew up Mormon. He's no longer a practicing Mormon, but he grew up Mormon. And I immediately called him when I learned about the Mormon's input into the translation of this work. And even though I have read the Book of Mormon, I have not read the Pearl of Great Price. And I know that there is a, a book in the Pearl of Great Price, the Book of Abraham, I believe it's called. And I'm not sure... If the book of the Revelation of Abraham and the book of Abraham are the same, I don't know um, because I have not read it yet. And I'm just now looking at the Apocalypse of Abraham. However, the story of their conception and how both of these books came to be are two different stories. Um, I double checked that. The book of Abraham and the Pearl of Great Price came about in Mormon doctrine in uh, more of the middle of the 19th century. Whereas this obviously came about and was translated in the at the end of the 19th century. And I'm just not certain if the book of the Revelation of Abraham or the Apocalypse of Abraham, as it was translated for the magazine in 1898, is a part of the Mormon doctrine today. I don't know. Or if it was just translated for a magazine for people to see. Um, if you are Mormon or you have more of uh, information on that, I'd love to love to hear from you. Uh, I am going to talk more about more about this with Tom as I learn more, as we read more, to try to figure out if there is a correlation between the two or not. You know, it could well, very well be that there absolutely isn't, which is kind of what I'm seeing, because it is the same person, so you are going to hear some of the same stories regarding the same person. But I just thought that was interesting, and I wanted to point that out before we moved forward further into this, this story. Now, 20 years later, this book was retranslated by a man named G.H. Box and J.I. Landsman. Now, this is the copy that I'm going to be reading from. It just happened to be the copy that I downloaded originally when I downloaded the PDF of the Apocalypse of Abraham before I really knew anything about the text at all. Now, I went, went into like research uh, a, a G.H. Box as the person who translated it. Turns out that he is a Hebrew lecturer, a professor, or was, he's no longer with us, but he was a Hebrew lecturer at King's College in London. And the first edition of this book was released in 1918. That's why I'm saying he's no longer with us. I wish he were. 
with us because I have a lot of questions, but um, no, he is no longer with us. And I studied a lot of what he found with this book from a scholarly point of view, and I agree with his fi findings. Even though in a lot of his works he goes back and forth between the two arguments between whether this book is as old as like the Old Testament of the Torah or whether it's a newer copy, he plays both sides of the fence a lot, but there is some compelling evidence which leads me to believe that he probably thought that it was an older text, um, more of like the Torah-based text, than a newer one from some of his findings in Hebrew, which we're going to get into. So I'm going to read you a quote from him. He said, Our principal aim in a word is to make some difficult text important for the study of Christian origins, more generally accessible and faithful in scholarly translations. And so that in itself, again, makes me believe that he is more along the lines that this was definitely a legitimate text that was there uh, in the origins of the Christian faith, which of course would have then go back to the origins of the Jewish faith, seeing that Christianity is basically another form or should be another form of Judaism. It's like Judaism 2.0. So now Box talks a lot about some of the names that are used in this text being of Hebrew origin. For example, in the book, we're going to see an idol called Merimath. I hope I'm saying that right. That's M-E-R-U-M-A-T-H. And from Hebrew, this can be translated into the Stone of Deceit. And these are idols um, that are worshipped in the story by a polytheist, which we're, I'll get into when I go through what the books, what the story is going to entail. There's also an idol called Barasat, which is Aramaic for son of fire. And we know Aramaic was also a language that was spoken by, possibly by Jesus, that this is an older language from that area. Now he also talks about something called Termas Aquo. Again, I hope I'm saying that right. That's Hebrew. And this is referring to the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem. Now this destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem happened in 70 AD. However, as we see in this book, this book was a book of prophecy. So that doesn't mean necessarily that this was talking about stuff happening relevant to the day, that this was a modern writing, it could mean that it was very much prophesized in the Apocalypse of Abraham that this temple of Jerusalem would eventually come down, which was many, many over a thousand years away from Abraham's life himself. Now another place that Box talks about where you see references to the apocalypse of Abraham is the Clementine Recognitions. And this Clementine Recognitions is a whole rabbit hole again unto itself that we could absolutely do a deep dive into. That's all I'm going to leave it at today because there's just so much to say about the Clementine Recognitions. And I will say the cool thing though is when I was looking into the Clementine Recognitions, I found a ton of people who had worked for churches, like one guy who used to be a Baptist preacher, um, one girl used to be heavily involved in her church, and then when they found the Clementine Recognitions and they started researching into them and realized that the church had called this heretical as well, and it absolutely didn't seem to be that way, they started to back away from the church. And one guy called it, you're leaving religion for freedom. You know, you're leaving the bounds of religion to actually find freedom when you step away from the organization and you you question why they say th certain things are heretical and you start to take that power back for yourself and read the stuff for yourself as we're doing. And I thought that was really great. You know, God, the God of Abraham, the, the God of light is a God of freedom. And the religion of Christianity has, has turned into anything but freedom. So when we do start to take that power back, when we do start to look at these texts for ourselves, it is almost like you're taking your relationship with God into your own hands. And, you know, when you're a little kid, your your parent will say, like, don't touch, don't do this or don't do that. And you'll say, like, why, mom? Why can't I do that? And the mom might say, because I said so. That might work for a three or four year old, but that doesn't work for an adult. The church can't say, because I said so. There has to be valid reason. And a lot of churches cannot give valid reason as to why these texts are heretical. We also know that this text was used by the Gnostics. And we've talked a lot about the Gnostics on this channel. They were the original Christians. The main world, the, the church world, will tell you that Gnostics were satanic. 
They absolutely were not. They were very, very, very spiritual. Anything that is coming out of the mainstream narrative, basically just flip it. It's kind of like when you watch the news, whatever the news tell you, it's, it's just the opposite. It's kind of like whatever, you know, these higher people in the church are telling you, just it's the opposite. You know, if they say the Gnostics were heretical, no, they were not. They were not at all heretical. They were very spiritual people. And they were the original Christians. And so we have the Gnostic Gospels, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Thomas, you know, these beautiful pieces about the soul of man, which was very Gnostic. We also see Gnostic features. So a Gnostic feature would be the right-hand path versus the left-hand path. The right-hand path was a path of purity and light or of God. The left-hand path was impurity and darkness. So that's a Gnostic theme. If you've ever talked about the right-hand path or the left-hand path, that's a Gnostic theme. Um, if you remember from our deep dive into Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan, he baptized his daughter Zena to the left-hand path, which is the path of darkness and impurity. So obviously there's something to the Gnostics if we're still using themes and concepts that were big in their faith, although the church wants to tell you they were heretical. It's a little bit of gaslighting there, isn't it? They weren't heretical, they were just the original Christians. All right, so just a brief look into the Apocalypse of, of Abraham, what to expect. You know, if this was a book, reading the back of the book, what is what are we, what are we gonna get? So the book is basically divided into two parts. The first part is chapters one through eight, and this is a narrative about Abraham's leaving the polytheism behind, the worship of many gods, to finding out what it means to be monotheistic, okay? We know that, that Abraham was born to people who worshiped many gods, his father made idols. We're gonna get into that, into the apocalypse of Abraham. And we're going to see him start to figure it out. We're going to see something about nature, how he starts to realize that nature is stronger than any of the idols that they worship, but yet there's a force that's behind nature that is guiding nature. And he starts to have these kind of like aha moments. And that's going to lead him on a monotheistic path. We do know that Abraham was an astronomer. And he was an astrologist. He was able to read the stars. A lot of Christians don't like hearing that, but astrology is not satanic. Again, that all started with the Hess Act during World War II. Factually speaking, the Pope, who is the head of the Catholic Church, was very much in line with the um, party that starts with an N that was run by a man named Mr. H, that's all I can really say, on YouTube. And um, there's lots of historical references to that, so if you don't believe me, do your own research on that. The Catholic Church was very much behind, behind what was happening in Germany during World War II. And Mr. H and the Pope decided to basically create this narrative that astrology, tarot cards, all these things were completely satanic. Because we know that Mr. H's party was heavily into the occult. Now, all the all occult means is hidden knowledge. And spirituality is both light and darkness. You know, demons are spirits as well as angels, right? Hillary Clinton is spiritual as well as Donald Trump. You know, they're just two different, two different ways of practicing practicing spirituality. The spirit world isn't just good stuff, it's also bad stuff. It isn't just bad stuff, it's also good stuff. The battle is fought on all levels of existence. So they started this narrative that these tools of divination were were basically demonic so that human regular people us would stop using them and this would give the bad guys uh, a leg up basically to be able to divinate because you can divinate bad spirits as well as good spirits. Um, I've ne you know I've never had a situation with divination where I've felt anything bad come through, but I know other people have. I think it's, you know, you, you can discern for yourself what's going on um, by the person who's doing the divination. I mean, look at our friend Janine from Tarot by Janine, that she's on our channel a lot. She reads tarot cards and the tarot cards what, what are what woke her up, are what re red pilled her about Mr. T and the white hats of what was really going on. And so we know that there is good behind these divination tools and we're taking that back and we're, we're making them good again. 
And that's the same thing with astrology. You know, uh, Melissa Red Pill the Nation said all the constellations that we see, Aquarius, Leo, Gemini, uh, Capricorn, all of them, they're all given those names by God. And they all have biblical stories by God. We know that the writers of the Old Testament were reading the stars. We saw that in the book of Jubilees where Enoch was taught how to read the stars just like the people before him were, as was Abraham. They were able to read into what was going on in the heavens so that we would see what was forecasted to play out on earth. It's a way of communication from God. So that was Abraham. He was, he was an astrologer. He was able to read the stars and he learned how to do that because he walked away from the idols because he realized that nature was so much more powerful. And behind that power of nature was another power that was moving nature, which we know to be God. And so after he figures this out, we have the second part of the apocalypse of Abraham, which is more apocalyptic. Again, this is where we see uh, revelations made to Abraham about the future of his people, of what is to become his people. And he also ascends into the heavenly reigns with an archangel, Joel. Now, I hope I'm saying that right. I've never seen this name before, but J-A-O-E-L, if that's not correct, let me know. And this is like an initiation to knowledge. Like God all of a sudden realizes that there's this kid down on earth named Abraham who has figured it out. And so he initiates him into the truth of the universe. And that's why we call the uh, Abrahamic religions, the Abrahamic religions are the God of Abraham because he was the starting point at and on our timeline after Adam and Eve, after the flood, Noah, where things got all kind of perverted again, all of a sudden Abraham has that aha moment as a very young person as to what's really going on. And so through the apocalypse of Abraham, the second part, we do see like this initiation where then he's able to teach his son Isaac, and Isaac then is able to teach Jacob, and then Jacob with his 12 tribes, which we just left off on with the... Um, the book of Jubilee. All right, so with that being said, let's get started into reading some of the Apocalypse of Abraham. All right, the Apocalypse of Abraham, part one, the legend. And again, this is chapters one through eight, title, the book of Revelation of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sarug, the son of Ru, the son of Erphiax, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared. And so we start with Abraham's conversion from idolatry. So this is going to be told, it looks like, in the first person. On the day when I planned the gods of my father, Terah, the gods of Nahor, his brother, when I was searching as to who the mighty God in truth is, I, Abraham, at the time when it fell to my lot, when I fulfilled the services, or quote unquote the sacrifices, of my father Terah to his gods of wood and stone, gold and silver, brass and iron, having entered into their temple for service, I found the God whose name was Mer Merimath. Again, that's the one I said earlier, which means, in Hebrew, the stone of the descent. Hewn out of stone, fallen forward at the feet of the iron god Nahan. And it came to pass, when I saw it, my heart was perplexed, and I considered in my mind that I should not be able to bring him back to his place, I, Abraham, alone, because he was heavy and being of a large stone. And I went forth and made it known to my father, and he entered with me. And when both of us moved him, the God forward, so that we might not bring him back to his place, his hell had fell from him while I was still holding him by the head. And it came to pass, when my father saw that the head of Merimath had fallen before him, he said to me, Abraham, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Bring me an axe of the small ones from the house, and I brought it to him. And he hewed aright another Merimath out of another stone without a head, and the head which had been thrown down from Merimath, he placed on it the rest of, rest of Merimath he shattered." So I guess what we're seeing is Abraham observing how these idols can fall and break. And he's like, well, that's kind of weird. If they're gods, why are they falling and breaking? And his dad just quickly goes and fix, fixes another god that looks like the one that just broke. 
And he made five other gods and gave them all to me and commanded me to sell them outside in the street of town. And I saddled my father's ass and I placed them upon it and went towards the inn to sell them. And lo, merchants from Fandana and Syria were traveling with camels going to Egypt to trade. I spoke with them and one of their camels uttered a groan and the ass took fright and sprang away and upset the gods. And the three of them were smashed and two were preserved. And it came to pass when the Syrians saw that I had the gods, they said to me, why didst thou not tell us that thou hadst God? Then we would have had brought them. Basically like we're dealing with these fragile idols that keep breaking and we see this young Abraham like kind of watching this like why are the gods breaking and now we see these travelers who are like if you told us you, we had you had these gods with you we would not have brought our horses and our donkeys because obviously they've scared them and shattered them instead of realizing that if these were real gods then they wouldn't have broken to begin with. So why didst thou not tell us before the ass heard the sound of the camel and they would not have been lost? Give us at any rate the goods that remain and we will give thee the proper price for the broken gods, also for the gods that have been preserved. For I was concerned in my heart as to how I would bring to my father the purchase price and the three broken ones I cast into the water of the river which was at the place and they sank into the depths and there was nothing more of them. So Abraham, young Abraham, was more concerned about bringing the money back to his dad than actually selling somebody a god. But he got the money because these people that he sold them to really thought these breakable idols were gods. When I was still going on the way, my heart was perplexed within me, and my mind was distracted. And I said in my heart, what evil deed is this that my father is doing? Is not he rather than the god of his gods? since they came into existence through his chiefs and latches and his wisdoms? And is it not rather fitting that he should worship my father since they are his work? What is the delusion of my father and his work? All right, so again, he's saying, my father is the one that created these idols. So why aren't the idols watch worshiping my father who created them instead of my father worshiping these idols that he created? This is weird. Behold, Merimath fell and could not rise in his own temple, nor could I by myself move him until my father came, and the two of us moved him. And as we were thus too weak, his head fell from him, and he set it upon another stone of another god, which he had made without a head. And the other five gods were broken in pieces down from the ass, which were able neither to help themselves nor, nor to hurt the ass, because it had broken them to pieces." Nor did their broken fragments come up out of the river, and I said in my heart, If this be so, how can Merimath, my father's god, having the head of another stone, and himself being made of another stone, rescue a man or hear a man's prayer and reward him? While I cognitated this, I reached my father's house, having watered the ass and set out hay for it. I brought the silver and gave it into the hand of my father Terah. When he saw it, he was glad, and he said, Blessed art thou, Abraham, of my gods, because thou have hast brought the price of the gods so that my work was not in vain. Now notice here he's already calling him Abraham and we know from the book of Jubilee that Abraham's name was first Abram. Now in my opinion just because he, they have Abraham written here before technically the name was changed to Abraham from Abram doesn't really mean a whole lot because this is a translated copy and we know him as Abraham so it simply could have just been uh, Professor Box just putting the name that we all knew, which was Abraham here instead of Abram. And I answered to him, Hear, O my father, Terah, blessed are the gods of thee, for thou art their gods, since thou hast made them, for their blessing is in ruination and their power is vain. They who did not help themselves, how shall they then help thee or bless thee? And I have been kind to thee in this affair because of using my intelligence. I have brought thee the money for the broken gods. And when he heard my word, he became furiously angry with me because I had spoken hard word against his gods. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? We get, at least I do, I get a lot of very, very vicious emails um, from people claiming to be Christian because I'm pointing out where the church might not be a Christian organization right and so sometimes people get mad when you show them you're the messenger you're showing them where there might be some corruption I've even gotten um, D E A T H threats 
in my email from Christians from reading these books that are considered heresy by the church and still I say as in one of you guys said in an awesome comment are you practicing Christianity or churchianity because if you're actually practicing Christianity you would never send an email like that to somebody else so obviously the church in that point becomes your God not God and so we see Tara getting upset with Abraham because Abraham's pointing it out to him like Dad, you made these idols. You are their creator. So why aren't they worshiping you? So reading forward, I, however, having thought over my father's anger, went out. And after I had gone out, my father cried, saying, Abraham. And I said, here I am. And he said, take and collect the splinters of wood, out of which I made gods of pine wood before thou camest, and make ready for me the food of the midday meal. And it came to pass, when I collected the splinters of wood, I found under them a little god, which had been lying among the brushwood on my left, and on the forehead was written, God Barasat. So notice on his left. So now we're seeing, we're starting to see that Gnostic notion of the right path and the left path, which again, in my opinion, according to all my research, the Gnostics were the original Christians. So they were the Jewish 2.0. And so this left and right path obviously came before in the Old Testament from the old Jewish faith, which we're reading right now in the Apocalypse of Abraham. And I did not inform my father that I had found the wooden god of Barasat under the chips. And again, Barasat is an Aramaic word for son of the fire. And it came to pass when I had laid the splinters in the fire in order that I might make ready food for my father. On going out to ask a question regarding the food, I placed Barasat before the kindled fire, saying threateningly to him, Pay careful attention, Barasat, the fire. Do not die down until I come. If, however, it dieth down, blow on it that I, it might burn up again. And I went out and accomplished my purpose. So basically, he put Barasat by the fire and said, like, If you're really a real god, you're not going to let the fire burn you up are you and you're also going to blow on it and keep it going for me for when i return so here's young abraham testing these gods and on returning i found barisat fallen backwards and his feet surrounded by fi fire and horribly burnt and i burst into a fit of laughter and i said to myself truly O barisat thou canst kindle the fire and cook food and it came to pass while i spake thus in my laughter he barisat was gradually burnt up by the fire and reduced to ashes and i brought the food to my father and he did eat and i gave him wine and milk and he was gladdened and blessed his god merimath and i said unto him o father tara bless not thy god merimath and praise him not but rather praise thy god barisat because loving thee more he has cast himself into the fire to cook thy food and he said to me and where is he now is he burnt to ashes in the violence of the fire and reduced to dust and he said great is the power of Barisat I will make another today and tomorrow he will prepare my food so again Abraham's father is not getting it Abraham was making a joke like you shouldn't you should be praising Barisat because basically he's in your food right now he fell into the fire to cook your food the idol didn't survive you know, and still his dad's not getting it. He's like, okay, well, I'll just make another one tomorrow. When I, Abraham, however, heard such words from my father, I laughed in my mind and sighed in the grief and in the anger of my soul and said, how then can that which is made by him manufacture statu statues be a helper of my father? Or shall the body then be subject to its soul and the soul to the spirit and the spirit to the folly and ignorance? And I said, it is fitting once to endure evil. So I will direct my, my mind to what is pure and lay my thoughts open before him. And I answered saying, O Father Terah, whichever of these thou praisest as a god, thou art foolish in thy mind. Behold, the gods of thy brother Ora, which stand in the holy temple, are more worthy of honor than of these. For behold, Zacchaeus, the god of thy brother Ora, is more worthy of honor than thy god. Merimath, because he is made of gold, which is highly valued by the people. And when he groweth old in his years, he will be remodeled. But if your god Merimath is changed or broken, he will not be renewed because he is a stone, that which is also the case of the god Joavon. 
Who standeth with Zacchaeus over the other gods? How much more worthy of honor is he than the god of Barasat, who is made of wood, while he is forged in silver? How is he made, by adaption of man, valuable to outward appearances? But thy god Barasat, while he was still before he and been prepared, rooted up upon the earth, and was great and wonderful, with the glory of branches and blossom, thou didst chew out with an axe, and by the means of thy art he hath been given into a god." And lo, his fatness is already withered and perished. He has fallen from the height to the ground. He hath come from great estate to littleness, and the appearance of his continence hath vanished. And he, Barasat himself, is burned up by the fire and reduced to ashes and is no more. Thou sayest, Today I will make another, which tomorrow I shall make ready for food. He hath presided to utter destruction." Behold, the fire is more worthy of honor than all things formed, because even that which is not subjected is subjected unto it, and things easily perishable are mocked by its flames. So we see Abraham starting again to recognize nature. Fire, earth, wind, the stars, water, these are all elements of nature. And he's starting to realize that this nature is more powerful than these so-called gods that his father has made. And so he's starting to figure out that there's a source, a life force behind nature that's directing nature that is not of these gods. But even more worthy of honor is the water because it conquereth the fire and satisfieth the earth. But even I do not call God because it is subjected to the earth under which the water is inclineth. But I call the earth much more worthy of honor because it overpowereth the nature and the fullness of water. Even it, however, I do not call God because it too is dried up by the sun, is a portion to man to be titled. I call the sun more worthy of honor than the earth because it with its rays illuminateth the whole world and the different atmospheres. But even it I do not call God, because at night, and by clouds of its course, is obscured. Nor again do I call the moon or the stars God, because they are also in their seasons, obscure their light at night. So we know that constellations, again, the stars have seasons. We're in the seasons, season of cancer right now. Terra, my father, for I will make known to thee the God who hath made everything, not these we consider as God. Who is he, or what is he? Who hath crimsoned the heavens and made the sun golden, and the moon lustrous, and with it the stars, and hath made the earth dry in midst of the many waters, and set it in thee, and tested me in the confusion of my thoughts? Yet may God reveal himself to us, through himself. And it came to pass, while I spake thus to my father terror in the court of my house, there cometh down the voice of a mighty one, from the heaven in the fiery cloud burst, saying and crying, Abraham, Abraham. And I said, Here I am. And he said, Thou art seeking an understanding of thy heart of the God, the God of this creation. I am he. Go out from thy father Terah, and get thee out from the house, that thou also be not slain in the sins of thy father's house. And I went out, and it came to pass, when I went out, that before I succeeded in getting out in the front of the house of the court, there came a sound of great thunder, and burnt him and his house, and everything whatsoever in his house, down to the ground, forty cubits. So that ends part one, which we're going to end it there today, before we get into part two. So again, to recap, basically, young Abraham is very, very confused by these idols that his father worships and makes. He's starting to realize that there are elements in life, which is nature, that are stronger than these idols. And then he realizes that all of nature basically works together under the hand of an almighty creator. And once he figures this out, and once he calls out to know that almighty creator, God answers back to him, tells him to leave his father's house. And as he's leaving, his father's house burns down. Okay, so picking up next week, we will start with part two, which starts the second part, the apocalypse, which again comes into the revelations. So that should be super exciting. All right, guys, I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Leave me your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. I hope you all are having a wonderful, wonderful day, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.